Good morning. I'm Priscilla, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm so grateful to be bringing the message to you this morning. Our first reading, uh, we often choose something that is light and hopeful, maybe even humorous, but that's, I made a different choice today. Um, I'm going to share a brief poem written by Fatima Z. Saeed called Starry Night Over Gaza because we continue to fund the genocide that is taking place there. So um, I thought this was a beautiful piece. How high can a missile fly? Does it raise the moon? Can it reach the stars? No. Orphan child, let's play a game. Let's orbit the tent the morgue and the streets you called home. Let's gather your toys, your limbs, and your long-lost smile. Yes, your friends can come too, and Mama will meet us there. Now step into my palm. Let me scatter you gently across the sky. Let me make constellations of your laughter. And turn your tears into stardust so that when night falls, you are no longer afraid of the dark. And when the bombs chase us here on earth, I can look up from the rubble, see your twinkle, see your light, and know that you have outlived the night. Fatima Saeed. Our second reading today is the prayer of thanksgiving. Kit mentioned that this is the final um, sermon in our non-canonical text that we've been um, studying for the last two months. Um, it is brief enough that we can share the whole thing, and I have asked Kip and Ruth to help me with that. So I'm going to give you this, Ruth. Don't forget to hold it that way. Um, so we're going to read for you the prayer of thanksgiving. We give thanks to you. Every heart and life stretches toward you, O name untroubled. Honored with the name of God, praised with the name of Father. To everyone and everything comes the kindness of the Father and love and desire. And if there is a sweet and simple teaching, it gifts us mind, word, and knowledge. Mind that we may understand you, word that we may interpret you, knowledge that we may know you. We rejoice and are enlightened by your knowledge. We rejoice that you have taught us about yourself. We rejoice that in the body, you have made us divine through your knowledge. The thanksgiving of the human who reaches you is this alone. That we know you. We have known you, O light of mind. O light of life, we have known you. O womb of all that grows, we have known you. O womb pregnant with the nature of the Father, we have known you. O never-ending endurance of the Father who gives birth, so we worship your goodness. One wish we ask. We wish to be protected in knowledge. One protection we desire. That we not stumble in this life. And that is the prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you both for your help. Uh, the prayer of thanksgiving, uh, now referred to as the Nag Hammadi Library, um, is, is part of that collection that we've been talking about. Today, I want to talk about your relationship with God. Intimacy is a feeling of closeness and connection in an interpersonal relationship. The state of being intimate is marked by the consensual sharing of deeply personal information, which is what we sometimes do in the act of prayer. Can you think of the last time that you shared deeply personal information with God? Gandhi, the great spiritual teacher, said, prayer is not asking, it is a longing of the soul. It is a daily admission of one's weaknesses. And so it is better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. We are reminded that prayer of the deepest kind is more a pledge of gratitude for that which has already been received 
more so than a plea for something not yet experienced. Such an effort refreshes the soul. By admitting our weaknesses, we lay down all the masks that we show the world, and as we do, what is holy often floods in. Through our study in July and August of non-biblical wisdom texts, it's been exciting to learn just how ahead of their time these writings were when it comes to divine gender fluidity. A number of ancient writings from the Jesus people, including the Prayer of Thanksgiving, the Gospel of Truth, the Odes of Solomon, and the Gospel of Luke all talk about God and Jesus in terms of female and male at the same time. How and why did we unlearn this ancient wisdom? Week after week, we've been blessed with texts that center highly capable women leaders and utilize images for God that are blatant about the feminine nature of God and emphasize their message using bodily metaphors for the divine. This week is no exception as we turn our attention to the prayer of thanksgiving. Today, most of our prayer is done individually except for maybe the weekly communal prayers that we offer together in church. Maybe sometimes you have somebody at home that you grab their hand and pray with them, but often it's an individual act. For the most part, we pray in our bedrooms, in our private, quiet spaces. If you're like me, maybe sometimes your car or shower transforms into a prayer closet. But at the time of Jesus, and for 200 years thereafter, Probably the main place that people prayed was in festive meals of 10 to 25 people that would last two to three hours. Don't worry, I promise not to hold you that long. (laughs) Surprisingly, these festive meals took place with everyone lying down. I don't quite get it. Maybe they had better digestion than we do. Sometimes the couches could accommodate enough space for two people to lie together. And these prayers did not generally take place in a quiet setting. The setting was joyful and boisterous with lots of eating, drinking, conversation, and singing. It makes me think of the atmosphere at the recent Democratic National Convention with their theme of joy. Some of the earliest Christ meals themselves were explicitly called Eucharist, a Greek and Coptic word that means Thanksgiving. Such a meal contained a number of prayers said at the beginning, middle, and end of the gathering. Early Jesus people regularly looked for new language with which to pray, language that reflected their creative and intense relationship to God. The prayer of thanksgiving that you just heard sparkles with evocative imagery. And because we get so much pregnancy and womb language in this text, I want us to picture what happens when one or two people make an intentional plan to get pregnant. They don't just want to conceive, but rather they long to bring a child into their lives. As you know, longing is different than wanting. It comes from deep inside and it's not easily satisfied. 40 weeks is an awfully long time to build up expectation for what's to come. You do all that you can to prepare, knowing full well that there is nothing that will prepare you for how your life is about to change. You dream about what this new life will look like, smell like, and be like. You rejoice because you can only imagine and anticipate the sweet intimacy of truly getting to know this being over a life. This is the longing we hear in this prayer. The people praying long to truly know God. The text says, and there is a sweet and simple teaching. It gifts us mind, word, and knowledge that we may understand you, that we may interpret you, that we may know you. Over and over again, we hear the phrase that most expresses their longing. We know you, and we have known you. And that knowing leads to a reaction, expressions of worship and praise. At the end of a long-awaited nine months of pregnancy, if you are blessed with a healthy baby, whether you are the parent, the grandparent, 
the auntie, the uncle, the sibling, biological or chosen family, what state do we find ourselves in at the end of that long-awaited period? How do we respond to the blessing of new life? Why, of course, we worship the precious child. We long to know them and for them to know us. We long to protect them that they may not stumble in life, just as the words of the prayer say. And almost immediately, we have a tendency to give them nicknames. We can't help ourselves. I used to call my girls Cheeks McGee because they both had the plumpest cheeks possible because they liked breastfeeding too much and the cutest fat rolls. My family given nickname is Philly and a handful of people still only call me by that name um, and it's because of how my personality presented. My dog has more nicknames than I can count. Griff the Stiff is one of them and sometimes he's big butt because of the posture he takes when he's propped up on our sofa looking out the large bay window. My dearly departed father-in-law's nickname for my husband Aaron was Sport. You see, nicknames convey intimacy. In the text, the people praying use their creative juices to come up with nicknames for God. The names that they call God include Name Untroubled, Light of Mind, Light of Life, Womb of All That Grows, Womb Pregnant with the Nature of the Father, never-ending endurance of the father who gives birth. Uh, this imagery for God in the prayer of thanksgiving brings us right back to our pregnancy metaphor. In the ancient portrait of God, God explicitly has a womb, and God's womb makes everything grow. This prayer makes the case that God's body made humans divine, which links to what Kip shared with us last week. We are the precious new life birthed by God. And if that's the case, God anticipated your arrival, longs to know you, has nicknames for you, and worships you as their creation. What do you think God's given nickname might be for you? If slacker comes to mind, then you're not on the right track. Maybe it's precious one, sweet pea, my love, or one who is forgiven and cherished. If we want to grow spiritually, the two most important questions that we must ask ourselves over and over again are, is God satisfied with the intimacy between us? Am I satisfied with the int intimacy between us? Can we as a community collectively say, we have known you, God? The thing about intimacy is there is always room for growth. We have to be creative to keep the relationship between ourselves and God fresh. What will you do in order to woo the being, the spirit that made you divine? How can you draw just a little closer? What does your prayer of thanksgiving sound like? Go home and write it down. What names for God might you use when you're at your most creative? When is the last time you truly expressed worship for God's goodness? When did you last feel gratitude surge through your body in a way that words cannot express? That's prayer, too. Words aren't always involved. This sermon is here to remind you that you are invited to a creative, intense, intimate relationship with God. I'll close with the words that open the prayer of thanksgiving. This is the prayer they said. We give thanks to you. Every life and heart stretches towards you, O oh, name untroubled, honored with the name of God, praised with the name of Father. This is the good news of God. Amen.